Now it is time for Dr. Soma, and let me get your um, slides back. Thank you for CITEN for inviting me. Uh, particular thanks to the board, to Natalie, to Chris, with whom I work very closely to both of them. I would like also to acknowledge the wonderful relationship I have had with Diane. Working with her, she's been very patient with me, taking some sort of my technical term and translating it into legal jargon. <laughs> That's what makes possible the collaboration between the scientist and the lawyer. And so here we are. So, because I may end up with some strong statement at the very end, I think it's important, I was told, that I should maybe reinforce my, 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 my background, where I come from. I've been in academia since 1981, and Boulder since 1984. Uh, as you may know, in academia, we're supposed to spend about 40% of our time in teaching, the rest in research. And my research has been on concrete deterioration, of aging of infrastructure, and risk assessment of structures. Uh, it has been mostly with dams and nuclear reactors. Uh, I have been funded by a number of agencies to do that work because in academia, yes, we also have to raise money to support ourselves in the summer for the student, for the labs. So I've been fortunate to get funding from various agency uh, a few years ago from TEPCO in Japan, to a power company, for whom I did work on ASR. From uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, also for ASR. And last but not least, from NRC, which funded me for three years to do work on ASR. And about a year ago, I started a new project to help the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation or to help them understand how to manage dams which are suffering from ASR. As you may know, ASR has been plaguing dams for a long time, so there is a long history of research activity associated with ASR and dams. And only recently has it been discovered in a nuclear reactor, at least in this country. There were two other examples, one in Canada, in TE2, and one in Japan, Utica. So, uh, so much for my credential. How did I come to work with CTEN? Well, in academia, we publish or perish, we write paper, we, we, we do our research, we conduct our test. But it's nice to see if we can also put into application what we have taught or researched on. And about four years ago, I came across some documents showing evidence of ASR in Seabrook. And thanks to Adams, I was able to download a couple of documents and wrote a paper which was published in Nuclear Engineering and Design associated with this topic, summarizing what I read, highlighting what I thought was wrong, and highlighting what probably should be done. Soon after I got my grant from NRC, uh, may, I may mention it was about 700,000 for three years, and NRC gave another $7 million to NIST to do research on ASR. So the reason I mentioned that because in about 20 minutes, I would come to say that all of this money is wasted because NRC never listened, never read, never applied either what I did or what NIST has done, which is a bit shocking. Or NIST is the National Institute of Science and Technology, formerly National Bureau of Standards. And uh, then when I read those documents from uh, detailing the analysis of testing done in Seabrook, I was shocked. I was shocked by the sophomoric approach which was followed. I was shocked about how simplistic the analysis has been done. I was shocked by the erroneous assumptions which were made. I was shocked by some of the statements which were made. I said, wait a minute, that's not how it's supposed to be. We're dealing with nuclear reactors. We're dealing with potential problem. Uh, we're dealing with safety of many people. And there is a mismatch between what the scientific community knows and what is being enforced by NRC. Uh, and uh, as such, I decided to be involved with CITEN. And forgive me if I say that I wanted to do it pro bono because I feel very strongly that as part of my academic uh, involvement, it's part of what I'm supposed to do. 
to educate not only students but also the public and but also uh, the regulatory agency are not doing the homework. Uh, basically, it is sad that ultimately the citizen group like CITEN is the one who ended up doing, as far as I know, the first independent experts review of something as important as the CBP licensing and uh, license amendment request. Okay. So here we are, and I am given about 30 minutes to talk to you about ASR and uh, on CBOOC. So the way I have framed my uh, talk here is to put it in terms of 20 questions. All what you wanted to know, I'm going to try to ask about ASR <laughs> and CBOOC. Uh, there are three good parts, basics, testing and analysis. So basic, that's one of the fundamental issues that we fundamental, uh, what we know about ASR. And I will be highlighting uh, special topics that have been completely neglected by NRC or by, or by uh, Nestero. Testing and analysis, so of course this is based on what I have read uh, in from public document in this conference today, uh, associated with the testing which were done in the Ferguson Structural <coughs> Engineering Lab in the University of Texas at Austin, and analysis performed by SGH in Boston. And finally, the question that I've been asked a couple of times, is Seabrook operating safely now? Will Seabrook be safe to operate in the next 20 years, so on and so forth? So before we can get to question 18 to 20, let's start by looking briefly about what is ASR. From chemistry, we all remember that there are, whenever we have an acidic and the basic components, they react, and then we have reactions. In our case, we have cement, which is alkaline, and we have in the aggregate some silica, which is acidic, they react together and we get an alkali silica reaction. So the problem with this reaction is that it grows, it swells, and not only does it swell, as a result of the swell we also have cracks because concrete is weak in tension, and very soon those cracks are going to be filled with gel. So it will have gel inside the crack, the whole thing is swelling. It's swelling, it's causing cracking. And those cracks are so-called map cracks, which are easily identifiable uh, in the structure. If you happen to have reinforcement, those cracks tend to align themselves with the reinforcement. And the problem with ASR is that it's going to reduce the strength of the concrete. It is going to reduce the capacity of concrete to carry tensile forces. It is going to result in increased deformation, that's what we call elastic modulus. And it's going to reduce the shear strength of concrete. And I'm saying shear strength of concrete, and not talking about shear strength of structural components, because that's a game that they still have been playing. They've done tests on enforced concrete beams. We're talking here about the concrete itself. Also, something which has been neglected and all the investigation have seen, there was no attempt to properly understand the type of aggregate that we have. I mentioned that the reaction is caused in part not by the silica present in the aggregates. While well, not all aggregates are, called, are created equal. Some of them are so-called early expansion, some of them are called late expansion. That is, some of them would take them only 15 years to expand, others may take them 50 years to expand. We have to make the distinction between the two through appropriate petrographic studies. Also, for those of you who are not familiar with concrete, concrete is essentially cement, aggregate, sand, and water. Well, sand can also be reactive, and the sand would react much quicker than the aggregate because it's much smaller. It has what we call a larger surface to volume ratio. So the sand would react immediately, almost immediately, but the aggregate would react later on. So those are subtilities which are important in properly understanding what is going on uh, at Seabrook. So, the concrete swells. You can look at it as a sponge which is swelling. If you constrain the swelling in one direction, the swelling would increase in the other direction. So again, it's swelling, what you call isotropic, in one direction. If you constrain it in one direction, it increases the swelling in the other two. 
In the case of Seabrook, we have confinement in the vertical and in the circumference because of the reinforcement. But there is no confinement in the out of plane direction, so most of the expansion is in the out of plane direction. That has some impact also on some of the tests that we'll be talking about. One of the questions is, okay, we have observed that there is swelling, that there is ASR. Typically, it takes many years before we notice that there is ASR. And at some point we say, wow, there are cracks here, or the structure is deforming too much. Can we make a guess as to how much swelling occurred since the concrete was cast? And the answer is yes, we can make a rough estimate. And that's what our colleague petrographer can do through something called damage rating index. I will make sure to illustrate that in a minute. However, it requires some highly qualified petrographer. And those are not necessarily floating around Boston. <laughs> then the next question, okay, I have ASR. I am told that it expands with time. Can we have a rough idea by how much it's going to swell and how long for how long it is going to swell? That's an important question. You want to know, are we talking about 0.1%, 0.3%? By the way, 0 0.1 is quite a bit. It's a lot. 0 0.1, 0 0.3%. Is it going to take 10 years, 20 years, or 50 years? Again, there are tests which were not done, and those are called accelerated expansion tests. Basically, like any chemical reaction, Every chemical reaction is what you call thermodynamic, thermodynamically driven, which means you increase the temperature, the reaction goes faster. As simple as that. So you take a block of concrete, you put it in a room at 38 degrees centigrade or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or 60 degrees centigrade, and you accelerate the reaction. So let's say, simplistically put, in one year you can get expansion of 20 years. Never done. Those tests were never done. Yet, it could have been done. I can take a specimen that cutting edge, but it's done. And run a test and have an idea about how much swelling to expect within the next 20 years. How does ASR increase with time? And this is the famous sigmoid curve that we see very often. It follows an S-shape of the reaction, the expansion, sorry. It starts very slowly, it accelerates, at some point, you are going to eat up either all the silica or all the alkali. One of the two is going to be completely consumed, so the reaction has to stop. And that will be at this stage. We don't know right now if we are here, 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 or there. There are methods to estimate that. They were not done. I mentioned earlier that we can address, we need to address ASR by performing good petrography tests and determine something called damage rating index. What does it mean? It means taking a slice of concrete, putting it into a microscope, and look at potential crack within the aggregate, as in here. You can see that small crack in here. This is a, one of the best ways to assess the health, the deterioration of the concrete. That's not been done. That has not been done. Instead, what is being done, they are relying on so-called crack index on the surface. And I will talk about that later on, which is very misleading. And there are curves which correlate damage rating index with expansion. Exactly what we need. If the petrographer can tell me your damage rating index is equal to X, I can estimate roughly how much expansion has taken place. This picture shows you how we perform the so-called accelerated expansion test. We take a cylinder, we place small marker discs, we put it in a container with water, and we put that sorry inside uh, I call it it's not oven inside a container which can be heated up up to 60 degrees Fahrenheit it can be. Every X days, we take the specimen out and we measure the distance between those two points. 
by measuring the distance between those two points, we can determine the expansion as percentage, percentile. And we repeat that until, until we are reach a curve similar to this one. Then we can see when, at a temperature of 60 degrees, I got a total expansion, let's say, of 0.12%. That's what I need to know. And there are formulas, I mean, you slow, which can take us from 60 degrees to the room temperature or the temperature at which my structure lives. The colder the temperature, the slower the reaction. The reaction would progress very slowly in New Hampshire. The reaction would progress much faster in Texas because it's much warmer now. Then we have this equipped with this information, the demonstrating index, which tells us what is the past expansion or give us a good estimate for the past expansion with a so-called accelerated test which tell us by how much it's going to expand in the future. Those are essential parameters we take and put them in a so-called mathematical model, and our jargon is called finite element. Finite element is taking a complex structure and breaking it into bricks, or tetrahedron, and modeling it. Very commonly used. We use that technique to model building, cars, ships, submarine, and nuclear reactors. This is an analysis which I had performed where there is swelling of the concrete below grade because that was underwater. This is not zero, by the way. This is just a generic nuclear reactor structure. And I was also in the past involved with cracking or delamination of a nuclear reactor which was in Florida at Crystal River. So this is another finite element model of Crystal River. Why do we have different color in here? We have different color because of different properties, different amount of reinforcement. So we perform our analysis. In 2019, we don't satisfy ourselves with very simplistic, so-called linear elastic analysis because life is non-linear and life is not deterministic. So we have also, and things are not also always static. The main concern with zero is that deterioration of the concrete is going to reduce the shear strength, that is the capacity of the structure to resist lateral load due to earthquake. Okay? So the main concern is not some major damage occurring just under the self wave or under wind load. It's most likely, and I'm choosing my work carefully, most likely under seismic load. And we do have to account for seismic load in New Hampshire, no doubt about it. And so uh, we need to perform dynamic analysis. So we need to perform dynamic and nonlinear analysis. And as I mentioned earlier, until about 20 years ago, there was a certain arrogance from the part of engineer. We know it all. I'm going to give you an answer to the last decimal. Well, life is not always known, life is full of unknowns. So, NRC was a pioneer in introducing, in introducing a model of analysis which is this based assessment, probabilistic based <coughs> assessment. In other words, I do not know exactly a certain property, I'm going to assign to it what we call a probability distribution function. It's going to be like a bell curve. I know a mean and the standard deviation and it will operate within that realm. And all my analysis will follow consequentially, which means at the very end, I will not say in the year 2025, it's going to be cracked. I would say in the year 2025, there is X percent likelihood that it's going to crack. And this is a procedure that is very well accepted and has been pioneered by the NRC. None of that was done for CBO. So, are there many other structures suffering from ASR? I mean, you're not alone. There are other structures which suffer from ASR. As I mentioned earlier, there are some pretty large dams which suffer from ASR. Some of them are most from here, Canada. In Quebec, there is a huge dam, Beauharnois, 
in New Brunswick, there is a huge lab called Maktaquat Lab. They both suffer from ASR. They are both extremely expensive to replace because they are confronted with the question, should we kill down those dams and replace them or not? So I'm talking about decision in the order of 1.2 to 1.8 billion dollars. And yet they mm -hmm. suffer from ASR. Mm -hmm. However, Canadians are a clever bunch of people, as we know. And uh, they have the best people surrounding those entities, many famous Canadian researchers from university. Hydro-Quebec has some great scientists. And I happen to have been in, in uh, Quebec last week, visit them. They have things under control. They are following it. They are doing the so-called DRI, they are doing so-called accelerated expansion test. They are monitoring it in a much more, <coughs> forgive me, the term intelligent way than done in Cipro. Again, we cannot compare apple with banana. We on one hand, we are done, on the other hand, we have a reinforced complete structure. Nevertheless, I would feel comfortable living uh, downstream from those dams because I know it is very well uh, analyzed, documented, and extremely rigorous scientifically. Extremely rigorous scientifically, as it should be. Any structure which even a minor accident is likely to result in even one fatality is too much. So yes, so there is in Canada a number of examples of structures suffering from ASR, investigated, monitored by highly skilled engineer, and strong interaction with academia and the research community. Some of the best experts on ASR are to be found in Laval, Seabrook, uh, Sherbrooke, sorry, and University of New Brunswick. That doesn't mean that there are not some good ones also at the University of Texas, who have not been called upon, by the way. So how does ASR affect the nuclear plant, which is getting closer to our problem? The biggest concern is the shear strength during an earthquake. So basically, you have a cylinder, and you have a lateral load to the earthquake. The structure is to resist what we call shear forces at the base. At the base, not at the top, at the base. Okay? If the concrete at the base has been deteriorated as a result of ASR, there is room for concern. So the biggest concern is whether or not the structure can resist the seismic excitation. Especially that we know that those structures do not have what we call shear reinforcement. That is vertical reinforcement. There is the operational reinforcement, but there's not out of plane reinforcement. So this is a major concern. It's really the response of the structure when it is subjected to lateral excitation. And I'm, talk I'm not talking about wind, of course, I'm talking about seismic. I put a note here preemptively because Nextera and their subcontractor have said, well, we have tested beams and reinforced concrete beams, and we found out that the reinforced concrete beam, the shear strength is stronger than otherwise. Why? Because ASR is expanding. There is reinforcement, so that puts it under compression. So sure enough, it increases shear strength. Why did it spend more than $100 to those expense? Anybody could have told them. But it's evident. However, what they have happened is that they have made an amalgamation between testing beams and testing materials. And my concern is that those beams, I think it is somewhere here, were not really representative. In other words, they made assumption as to what is representative of a nuclear reactor and let's test it. Well, it is not representative. The details can be found in some of our report. The concrete mix was supposed to be identical, similar, representative, depending on which version of the document you read, you will see different adjectives. It's none of the above. I mean, they use aggregates. They use a limited amount of aggregates from a source close to Seabrook, mm -hmm. according to the public document. Okay? There is no indication in the public document that it is identical. Uh, I like to compare concrete with bread. 
bread is essentially made of flour, water, yeast. You mix them in different proportion, you can get a pita bread or a French bread or a chapati or whatever you want. <laughs> if you use different sources of ingredients, you can get a better French bread in Paris than you can ever get one from whole food. Why? Because we don't have the same type of flour here. Okay, and even water is important. So it is not enough to say, well, we have done tests and we got a representative a representative uh, concrete, it is swelling like it is swelling in, uh, in Cebu. That's not enough. So, again, there were a number of assumptions which were made, which were erroneous. I won't bore you with the details of the simplifying assumptions that were made in the test. However, most, one of the great concerns I had is that the specimen would crack even before starting the test. This is mentioned in the public report. Another part is redacted. The picture I am showing you here is a crack taken, uh, a picture taken from the PhD thesis of a student at Texas, who acknowledged in the introduction the financial support of NPR. In all likelihood, it is the same test that was done. Am I 100%? No, I'm not 100%. But the same type of crack was also described in the, in the report. What caused that crack? Well, as I mentioned, concrete swells, if it is constrained in this direction by the rebar, it's not going to swell, it's not going to expand in this direction, in the x direction. If it is constrained in the out of plane, in the y plane, by the part that you can see the cross section, it's not going to expand in that orthogonal direction. There is no constraint in the middle, in the z-axis. So sure enough, all the expansion is going to reorient itself in the z-axis, and it's going to swell. Concrete being weak in tension, it's cracks. And that's what happens. OK, if it cracks, then we should be able to test it for subsequent test because it's already damaged even before we started testing it. Yet indications are that specimen tested for shear might have cracked even before the test started. It's not clear how many, are not enough details, all of them, but at least that was of enough of the concern that it was reported that there was a crack. And again, this is picture taken from the thesis. You can click on it, and you can download the PhD thesis and get all the information you want. Uh, well, ASR test performed? No, getting index based on the petrographic analysis, no accelerated expansion test. Was the finite element analysis performed subsequently adequate? And the answer is no. <coughs> By the way, the first series of tests were performed in Texas. I believe it was under contract from NPR. The analysis were done by SGA, Simpson Comfort and and, uh, and it was a very simplistic analysis. And uh, certainly not one uh, commensurate with the gravity of the situation. It is an analysis as so simplistic that nobody in the right mind in academia would ever think about publishing a paper or even a report based on such an analysis. For instance, they ignore the fact that the expansion is temperature dependent, they don't account for temperature, they ignore the fact that the expansion is impacted by the state of stress, they don't account for it, they very indirectly and in a very convoluted way account for the degradation of the concrete, Everything is linear elastic, by the way, and the dynamic analysis don't even talk about it, as simplistic as can be. So those are some of the major concerns I have. And when it comes to monitoring, uh, we are told that there is a heavy reliance on two types of indicators. One on the surface crack index, on the surface of the, of the wall, and another one expansion through the wall. 
So expansion through the wall is done with what they call extensometer. And yes, those are good measurements. Those are reliable measurements. And that's good that they have. However, the reliance on the surface crack is pretty bad. It's wrong. Why? Because what I failed to mention earlier is that ASR, for the ASR reaction to occur, you need to have 80% relative humidity in the concrete. Once again, you need to have 80% relative humidity in the concrete. Any one of you has mixed concrete, you know that we put more water than we really need, otherwise it's very difficult to mix. And with time, the water on the surface is going to dry and evaporate. On, with time, the water on the surface will dry and evaporate. We have some shrinkage crack. Yet, inside, you still have the reaction fuming. It's actually taking place inside. So by the time the reaction inside manifests itself by increased crack widths on the surface, you are not in bad shape. Okay? Because the reaction was taking place inside and not on, on the surface. What you are measuring is misleading. That's one of the major concerns, personally, I have with their so-called monitoring. Never mind that subsequently monitoring is also tied with the analysis. So basically, testing, monitoring, and finite element analysis are three legs of the same stool that are very tightly connected one with each other. If one is wrong, it is collapse. If two are wrong, if three of them happens to be wrong, it goes. So, Coming from academia, we like to have, or sometimes we don't like to have peer review. What is peer review? You, say, you write a piece of research, you summarize it in a paper or in a manuscript, you send it to a journal, the journal would send it to people that you don't know, who are experts in the field, would criticize what you have written, and would come back at you saying, piece of garbage, turn it down, not even think to resubmit, or there is some value modify this, address this question, clarify this, and resubmit. And sometimes you have to go through one, two, or three iterations before a manuscript is strong enough to be published. We follow the same process whenever we are dealing with important structure. Uh, about 15, 20 years ago, I was on an, inter an, 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 an international review panel for Karun 4 which was a big dam in Iran. There was a group of structural engineers, myself, some Swiss engineers, invited over there to look at the calculation and to provide advice. At the time, it was still possible to fly over there. Uh, to provide advice, to say, well, this is good. How did you make this assumption? Have you taken into account this? Have you not taken into account that? This is very, very commonly done whenever you are dealing with a major structure uh, which had been analyzed or designed by one entity, no matter how good they are, no matter how good they are, there has to be a peer review assessment. As far as I know, this was not done. Uh, I understand there has been an internal review, and the internal review was by other people within the NRC, and there is no indication that they had the proper credentials to articulate meaningful comments. I may be wrong, but from what I've seen, it's a small world. I've not seen it. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, the NRC has funded me, but has also funded a major product with NIST, $8 million. What has been the impact of this research funded by the NRC on the assessment of Seabrook I've not seen it. Maybe it's somewhere there, but I've not seen it. So why spend all that money if you don't even take into account what your subcontractor or people who have granted some research money to develop? So here we come to well, start talking about the important question. Is Seabrook operating safely now? Well, I would say we really do not know. I'm not going to say yes, I'm not going to say no, I say I don't know. I don't know because the tests and the analysis conducted are fundamentally inadequate. Well, the NRC says, well, we are monitoring it. Monitoring what? The track index? 
for the expansion, what are the threshold value at which point you decide to evacuate, what are the threshold value when you see well something is wrong, what kind of subsequent analysis do you perform. Uh, so in light of that, I would say I don't know, because also the measurement they take do not feed directly into the finite element analysis, which at the very end is the ultimate tool to assess the safety. To assess the safety, you need material property, such as what I mentioned before, the DRI, the petrography, the test. You don't need to get the expansion to feed it in your finite element analysis. If anything, you do that to validate your analysis, to see, well, I did an analysis, I get an expansion of 0.2 millimeter. How does it match with what was measured? Yes, in that context, it's good. There is heavy reliance on inadequate crack index or monitoring. As I mentioned earlier, monitoring, analysis, and testing are very tightly coupled and intertwined, and each one of them was shown to be in that independently inadequate. And again, this is a many hours of communication with Diane to articulate and to back up such strong statement. Uh, do you think NSC had adequate basis to rely on CBO for additional 20 years? Based on the document file, that is based on my reading of the document, the short answer is no. Is it yes or no? And no maybe. It's no. Simple as that. And what further step do you recommend? Again, based on my experience, based on what I've seen done by other entities which have major structures separate from ASR, first of all, take a deep breath. Relax. There's no urgency. We're talking about 30 years commitment here. We're not going to rush things. I don't care if you spend one year or 10 years or 20 years doing an analysis. When a student comes to me and says, Professor Sama, I deserve an A because I put so much effort on it. I say, I don't care. So it's wrong. It makes no difference. And uh, this is exactly what's happening here. There is no mandate remedy. Any remedy is going to be a little bit painful. But hopefully, at the end, the public will be reassured, and the sea will be reassured, and the external will be reassured. The last thing the external wants is a massive lawsuit if there was an accident where they had been pre warned that there is potential for this to happen. So everybody needs to be reassured. The external first and foremost. Awesome. Yeah. They need to perform the DRI, petrography test. Yes, it is argued somewhere that they have done petrography tests and they will not, they found them not to be representative after a certain expansion. It's a very simplistic petrography test that they have done. And as I say, petrography test is not easy, it has to be done by very qualified people. Yeah. And accidental expansion test and proper finite element uh, studies. Give a call to the people of Hydro Quebec. Go pay them a visit. I can give you names in Hydro-Quebec. Talk to them. Ask them what have they done. They should be trained to organize a meeting with you and to tell you how they have been managing uh, ASR in Bouharnay Dam, which was built over 80 years ago. And we suffered massive ASR. Mm. I mean, big cracks. And catch up with the scientific literature. Don't just rely because I'm dealing with SGH, a big consulting company in Boston. We don't know. Those companies are accustomed to design structure. They're accustomed to design structure in accordance with existing codes. Maybe they're not that experienced in assessing the safety of existing structure, which is a bit more complicated, which requires what we call a linear analysis. And uh, so, that information can be found easily if you go to Google Scholar. Those of you have never heard of Google Scholar, try to type Google Scholar and you do a of keyword and you find plenty of articles addressing specifically what I mentioned here. And last but not least, perform peer review. Don't be afraid of peer review. I mean, sometimes it sounds like we don't want peer review because God knows what those crazy people are going to tell us. Let's keep it safe and and uh, hopefully everybody will be quiet. And saying about there is C10 standing in front of them. <laughs> so, let me terminate here by some key takeaways. Extraordinary complex problem require complex solution at the minimum. Don't think that you can confront a complex problem with some very simplistic analysis or very simplistic approach. 
and hope that nobody is going to raise their hand and say, wait a minute, something is wrong. <laughs> Sooner or later, things will go out. If it's complex enough, it deserves your attention. And let's not forget that R and NRC stand for regulatory. They need to regulate and not wait for the industry to write regulation for them. Otherwise, there is huge conflict of interest there. Who is going to regulate the regulator? So, unless until NRC takes step to rectify the decision to relicense Seabrook with a substandard program for addressing ASR, okay. what I'm trying to say is this is the very first instance where ASR occurs in a nuclear reactor. Probably from the last one. ASR takes many years to manifest itself, especially now that we want to extend the life of nuclear reactor from 40 to 60 and from 60 to 80, we are going to have more and more structures separate from ASR. I bet you anything that there are going to be more. If a structure in Texas next month or next year or next five years suffer from ASR and the current approach has been approved, all they have to do is to take the procedure followed by Seabrook and applied and garbage perpetuate, perpetuate itself. And that's how events to be a question of time before we have a major accident. So, uh, this is where I think that uh, I really, really believe that NRC should step up with its responsibility. I have had the good luck of interacting with NRC about six, seven years ago. There were some wonderful, wonderful people, I'm going to name them, Abdul Sheikh and Herman Grace. Herman Grace was a great guy, expert on concrete. I would see him writing paper, I would see him active in ACI conferences, meetings, very respected by the community. Abdul Sheikh was a great structural engineer who understands analysis. So my question is, where are you with Abdul Sheikh and the Herman Grave now at NRC? Where are they? They don't seem to be present. And that needs to be changed. Thank you. Are we talking about the uh, concrete in the, the fuel containment tank or the walls of the larger containment building or the storage cast? Like what concrete specifically are we concerned about? And my other question is um, kind of harkening back to the 1980s when this was under construction. Is, is there any correlation between the kind of, the quality of um, craftsmanship or, or workmanship and, and the, the cracking in the ASR, or is this just kind of a natural occurrence with old concrete? Thank you. Well, it has nothing to do with workmanship. It has nothing to do with workmanship. And as to the concrete, to the extent that I am aware of, It's present in multiple places. Uh, of course, there are zones that we couldn't inspect or take a look at when we were kindly invited to join the judges to take a look. Uh, the documentation actually is a little bit vague as to the extent and the location where the ASR manifested itself. Personally, I would have liked to see some sort of a drawing or a map showing around the perimeter what are the hotspots of the ASR. So I'm not sure I can fully address your question, but it seems to be in many places. Are the storage tank tanks for the spent, for the radioactive waste, are they? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yes, they are. Made of concrete. But they're much thicker, is that right? Um, may, may I, may just, I can just tell you from my reading that it, uh, I believe that it's true, Debbie, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, next year uh, the owners of Seabrook have conceded that all of the concrete in the safety related structures, which would include the spent fuel pool and the uh, reactor containment and the concrete within the reactor containment, all of those structures they have conceded have or probably have
some level of ASR in the board can see. Yes. Yes. Any so we, you got the answer to your question? Yes, thank you. Good. Anyone else? Uh, mentioned in the uh, presentation that there is no shear reinforcement like on that containment building. Does that mean there's no vertical rebar, no steel reinforcement that no, in that structure? There is vertical around the container, longitudinal vertical. There is circumferential all around. But in between, through the thickness, the reinforcement is minimal, practically no shear reinforcement. It is a horizontal rebound. Now think about the cylinder. In the vertical direction, there is rebound. In the circumferential one, there is rebound. Okay? But in between, in the radial direction, horizontal, there is not. And that's why, for instance, in the test I did in Ferguson Lab in Texas, there was reinforcement in two directions, but not in the third direction, to reflect the absence of shear reinforcement, typically in a nuclear reactor. Is it entirely absent? Probably not. Maybe there is some minimum for temperature effect, but for all practical purposes, there isn't. Any other questions? Please, if you would, just speak up. If the NRC is listening, what are the requests required? You want to take that? Then? Uh, Did you hear the question? Yeah. Um, well, your your next recourse is Congress, and uh, you know you could go to the Senate Oversight Committee, the relevant committee. Um, Senator Markey. Senator Markey has, for decades, been a strong critic. Uh, Seabrook and a real strong advocate for nuclear safety on many fronts. So I would I would really encourage you to contact him. Um. If I may just add one thing, uh, C10 is having to consider that if we lose before the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board our attempt to oppose the license amendment request, that we would then appeal. Yeah, I mean, we don't know yet that we would or that we wouldn't, but we have the opportunity to appeal, and that appeal would be to uh, one of the circuit courts, federal court. So that's also an option, which, of course, is going to be more of an expense, too. Uh, another question? Please. So monitoring doesn't give me a lot of comfort because ASR is a process that there's no cure for. So at what point of monitoring does something else need to happen? How do you know when enough expansion has taken place that something else needs to be done? And if something else needs to be done, what would be done? Well, that's a question for Nick Taylor. But for me to answer that question, I'm not sure what they could do because as I mentioned earlier, the expansion takes place mostly on the inside. What you measure on the surface, the complete has dropped. There's no reaction for all practical purposes on the surfaces. So, so does it need to be shut down? I mean, no, let's not, let, I mean, let's not get there. Yeah. All I'm saying is monitoring the way it is done as of now doesn't seem to be happening. And I mean this. Another question? Um, given the fact that the ARS is occurring at Seabrook, S ASR? ASR. Oh, sorry. Um, is this likely to be some precedent setting case? Yes, I mean, especially that now we are extending the licenses of some reactor from 40 to 60 and also from 60 to 80. So you bet you that by the time you have a couple of reactors, with a lifespan of 60 years or 80 years, the likelihood of having other suffering from the ASR is pretty high. Do you know how many are currently <laughs> operating? We, we don't. I don't think there's been any other reactors in the United States identified with ASR. But what Victor, I think, is saying is that 
there probably is ASR at other reactors. It takes a long time to reveal itself. And I think I just want to emphasize something he said earlier in his talk, which is the NRC doesn't have its own standards for ASR. One of the things he did was to bring a rulemaking petition and try to get NRC to establish standards, but they didn't. And so the situation is that basically next era has been allowed to develop the standard and the NRC has accepted it so that one could expect that the next time ASR arises at a nuclear plant that, that what next era has developed will be used. So this could affect other communities as well and we really need to push the government to do a better job of, you know, this happens sometimes with the NRC, they defer. There's a tendency, this is throughout uh, the federal regulatory programs, there's a tendency to let the regulated industry set the pace, establish the standards. But NRC needs to take that back and make its own decisions about what is needed here and set the standards for Seabrook and other plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in 2014, we wrote a, um, a rulemaking. And when we did it, what we said was that we knew what the tests need to be done to the Seabrook and the tests were not done by the NRC, and they had the tests available. And what we asked was, we don't know if the other plants in this country have ASR, but they all have concrete, and we don't know how much, is, how much it has affected any other plant, and they refused to do both. So the NRC has not taken the <coughs> acceptance for doing the testing that was required and we asked them to do it on all plants, and they refused. I just want to add that the NRC allowed the um, owners of Seabrook Next Era to maintain a proprietary status for the testing and, uh, and analysis that was done. And uh, there are two aspects to the consequences for that. On the one hand, uh, the owners of Seabrook are saying that their intention has been that they would then be able to sell to other reactors, the methodology necessary for testing and monitoring for ASR should it arise at other reactors. But the consequence for citizens is that there was no peer review. They were able, because of this proprietary status, to keep it entirely away from scientists like Victor uh, or, and people of equal stature to Victor around the country and around the world. The only reason that Victor was able to see the proprietary documents was because he became part of our case. So, so that was how this proprietary status has worked in, in to next year's benefit that isn't mentioned very often. And, and, and that is why we are calling for, um, you know, peer review being an, a crucial part of any testing and uh, uh, analysis methodology that is to be accepted for uh, a license amendment for ASR. Any other questions? We, we have time for one or two more. The library is going to start getting antsy that we have to clear out of here by 845. So we have to exit yeah, 845. So, so five, five more minutes maybe and then we're going to move. Go Jeff. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the doctor, you mentioned that there are two plant workers, or at least two plants outside the U.S that are dealing with ASR, I think so one in Japan and one in Canada. Uh, what have they done? Are, are, they, uh, are they also ignoring the problem or are they taking action? Well, the one in, uh, in Canada is called Gentilly 2. It was operated by Hydro-Quebec. It was very extensively analyzed by a methodology much more sophisticated than what I've seen here. But I must say they have closed the plant not because of the ASR, <coughs> For economic reason. What does it mean exactly? I don't know. I'm told for economic reason. And like what with the one in, in Japan. So we have to be careful not to say the growth because of that. Economic reason. Uh, Sarah, did you see your hand up? Uh, that was my question as well. Oh. I think there was also a plant in Belgium 
No. Was also close no. enough? No. Okay, so. One last one. Here's our last question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Senator Markey, but have other uh, public servants been, are they in any way, have they been informed of this, like uh, our rep Seth Moulton? Yes, I Attorney agree. General Healy. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that real quick. Yes. So tomorrow we're having briefings with policymakers, local, state, and federal, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And we do have representatives from those offices, including most of the congressional delegation in Mass and New Hampshire. I see uh, Amesbury um, Councilwoman Pam Day here, and state rep from New Hampshire. Uh, Rennie Cushing in the back as well, uh, Representative Hart, thank you again for coming. Um, so yes, there's tonight and then there's um, tomorrow as well for, for briefings. Um, and, and we've been in touch with them and, and they follow this case with interest as well. So, um, Any other burning, burning, burning questions? If not, I want to, let's give a round of applause again. all are um, to live here. It's a, this is a unique group. I've only been with C10 for a little more than two years, so I really feel like we all owe this group a debt of gratitude. Um, again, please sign up for our email list if you haven't already. Stop by the table if you'd like a brochure or anything like that. And thank you.